rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. extend a special welcome to everyone here and as well as everyone that's tuning in online as well. Um, we're glad that you are here joining us at Faith Fellowship Baptist Church and it is a blessing to, to worship with you guys. So as we continue in worship, I'd like to invite you all to stand and continue singing. Love 
Jesus, so 
We pray this morning that our worship, our hearts would be in the right place to just be fixated on you, oh Lord. And we just pray that this morning that you would enter our hearts and that you would you'd speak to us, Lord. Be that vision that we need to continue our days and, and follow you in the footsteps that you've laid out for us, Lord. I pray all of these things in your name. Good morning, everyone. Happy Chinese New Year to, to all here. I hope you were able to sleep through the fireworks last night, if that was bothering you. But if it's your first time here, we want to welcome you to Faith Fellowship Baptist Church. Such a joy to worship with you today. If you're new, we'd love to get to know you a bit more. Uh, we're excited today because in this new year, we are going to start with a baptism. Uh, and so I'm going to invite uh, Ryan Singh to come forward. And uh, just to give you a brief background on, on how this happened, I'm going to let him share his testimony. But uh, in our church, we lost two great men of God in these last couple of months. Uh, Fred Prakash, first of all, and then we lost uh, Jack Purdy. And uh, we had two funerals in, in this past week at our church of men who went off to be with the Lord. Uh, but through this tragedy... Uh, there is new life, and that is what we come to celebrate today, and I'm going to let Ryan just share his story with you, his testimony, before we have the baptism. Hi, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> um, so my story begins, um, I met my wife, Marilyn, back in 2012, and when we met, I wasn't a believer. I, I believed that there was a higher power, but I didn't believe that you know, who they were, or exactly. I believe that Jesus was a real person. He had existed, but I didn't, I just wasn't fully convinced of, of the miracles and of, you know, of, um, sorry, I can't really put my words together. I, I wasn't really convinced as, as a true believer. I, I just believe that there was something greater than us. Um, and over the years, she, 
she taught me, she showed me books, I read books, we read together, we watched numerous, you know, um, documentaries and whatnot together, and I f became more and more of a believer. Um, up until recently, I, I was still kind of doubtful. Um, last year, in December, purchased a home in California, um, and so that's, we're moving to California, so at the beginning, sorry, I'm kind of all over the place, but um, in January, I went to California to kind of do renovations on this house to get it ready before we as a family moved down. So I was there all by myself. I drove out there. Um, the week prior, Marilyn and I had drove down to drop all of our stuff, um, and it was a treacherous drive with all the stormy weather and whatnot. We were in two different vehicles, and it was terrifying to see her swerving behind me when in the mirror and whatnot, and we were fearful for each other's lives. Um, so then in this new year, when I went back by myself, um, Marilyn, was, she came to me in tears and she said, you know, Ryan, please make sure that you come back to us. We need you in our life. We can't be without you. And so she gave me this chain uh, with a cross on it and she said, wear this. I want God to be with you and he'll take care of you along the way. And I said, okay. So I put it on and I went on this journey. I drove there. It was about a 23-hour drive. Um... There was a lot of scary moments where I thought that I could have possibly died. There was, the visibility was next to nothing. It was zero visibility, snow, stormy weather, whatnot. People were swerving in and out of my lanes. I was terrified. I somehow made it. Um, and then I was at the house by myself. It was so silent in this house that during the renovations, I plugged my power drill in to charge. And I could hear the charger from across the room. That's how quiet it was. Um, I was being away from my wife and kids for about five days. I was getting really, really lonely and really sad. Um, and I'm the type of person that when I need to do something and I'm stressing out about it, I won't eat, I won't sleep, I'll just focus on what I'm doing. And that's kind of what I was doing the whole time I was there. Um, and it came, Marilyn said to me one day, she said, why don't you just take a break? Just like, you know, get a hotel, go stay in a hotel, have a proper night's rest, sleep, eat properly and then continue in the morning. And I thought, okay, yeah, I'll do that. So um, I got the other thing too is in the house, so all of our stuff is currently stored in the garage and the hot water tank was behind everything. So I was taking like two minute super cold showers and freezing cold water. Um, the heater wasn't really working, so it was freezing cold at night. So it was really, really uncomfortable for me. And so I was in this hotel room. I stayed the night. I had a great night's sleep. I spoke to her and the kids till I fell asleep. In the morning, I woke up. There was this continental breakfast. I had that. And I was so blessed, like feeling like so like thankful. And I, I verbalized it. I said, you know, and I was like, wow, like I feel I've never felt so thankful in my life before. Thank you. And I actually said, Lord, thank you for this food, and thank you for the rest that I so badly needed. Thank you for my family. Thank you for everything that you've helped me with. And at that very moment, I just broke out into tears, and it's crazy. I've never felt that overwhelming feeling of just kind of being cradled or taken care of or like love. I'd, I'd never felt that in my life, and I was just like, wow. It's almost as if like I thanked the Lord and he returned and said you're welcome and like I literally felt that I've never ever in my life felt that and I just broke out into tears uncontrollably crying, crying couldn't explain it and at that very moment Marilyn called me and she said what's wrong are you okay and I said yeah I'm I'm good and I explained to her what just happened and then I broke out into tears again and started crying again and she said well you know what that is right and I said what's that and she said well that's the grace of God and right there I was like yeah you're right and that's my story. <laughs> so I truly do believe now that, you know, it's not just, it, like, I don't, I, there's no doubt in my mind now that, that, you know, Jesus Christ, the Lord is our Savior, and I'm so thankful for, for having that experience. And that's all. <laughs> oh, actually, one, one last thing. One last thing I'd like to mention is... Um, so this morning, we're driving here, and actually it was last night. So we're driving last night, and um, our younger son, Castiel, said, he said, so, so dad's being baptized tomorrow. What does that mean? Does that mean that he's going to be closer to God? He's going to be closer to Jesus? And then my wife said, yeah, yeah, that's 
what it means. And so he said, well, I want to be baptized. <laughs> so, so she said, you know, it's, it's great, Ryan, that, you know, you, you're actually, by example, you're showing him that, you know, that to be with one with God is, is the way to be. And so, yeah. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so glad to hear the, uh, uh, listen to your testimony. Uh, in the meantime, like we'd like to, uh, uh, we'd like to give you time, two minutes to uh, greet one another. Why don't you rise and then we greet one another? I, I want you to go into room over there with your clothes, dry clothes, and then change and then be ready to uh, be baptized over up here. So Pastor Jeremy will be inside, and then uh, yeah, uh, stand up together and then uh, we just uh, stretch a little bit, arm and legs, and then welcome one another. Maybe you can say Happy New Year again. Happy New Year. I'll give you uh, five minutes today for special. <laughs> reason <laughs> yeah All right, you may be seated whenever you're ready. Uh, I believe Pastor Jeremy and Ryan are ready yeah, for baptism. Yeah. now. So one thing that uh, is worth sharing uh, when it came to the, the baptism, the same morning that, that Ryan had this personal experience with, with God was the same morning that his father-in-law, Fred, passed away. Uh, it was within one hour of his, of his father passing away. Um, so such an incredible story of God's faithfulness. Through such a tragedy, there is new life. And so we're here today. Uh, Ryan, have you personally accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Do you desire to follow Jesus through obedience in the waters of baptism? Yes, I do. And it's a privilege on behalf of our church and our congregation to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today for the new life that is in your Son, Jesus. We thank you that even despite this great tragedy of loss, that you are a God of resurrection, that you are still pursuing hearts today. And we pray that this would be the first of many, many baptisms this year in our church. Father, we thank you for the deep rest that you gave to Ryan's heart. And we pray that as he 
begins this journey of discipleship in you, that he would find his rest in you. Father, would you bless his family as they prepare to move to California, and may we as a church send them. May they continue to stay connected, Lord, and encouraged in the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Pastor Jeremy got healed like last, uh, last October, but he started, started uh, baptism now, so praise God for that. Wow. Excellent. Praise God. Um, the life of Christian is a life of a dis discipleship. Life of a discipleship is not about destination. It's about direction. So as uh, our dear brother Ryan made a decision to take this direction to Jesus, and we are going to continue to encourage him to, uh, him to be on the right track. And, uh, we have many ways to uh, stay in the right direction. One of the things I can say, faith groups. We have a small groups, men, women, children, and we have made many groups, but especially I want to uh, promote four groups today, uh, in this morning. Uh, women's Bible study happens Tuesday morning, 10.30. This time we are going to study Book of Romans. And if you will, please join uh, this group. And uh, you need to be woman, by the way. Yeah, that's a condition, one condition. And then there's something else for men as well. So go to the next slide. Uh, men, we gather together over... Uh, Zoom to uh, Thursday night, only for 30 minutes. This is like the checkup time. Like, just want to make sure that we pray, you know, together. So we just uh, encouraging one another and share our prayer concerns and praise items and also the verses we got encouraged over the last one week. So this is a great opportunity to be engaged uh, with the fellowship, with the uh, uh, in, in Christ with uh, brothers in our church. And also, women's uh, group reading happening by uh, uh, Hiju McDonald here. Uh, Hiju, can you raise your hand? And then, if you will, you can contact her and uh, join this uh, special group. And then, equipped to serve, we had an announcement last week. Uh, Christina Basri Chris, in charge of this ministry. If you are part-timer, it'll take about two years to complete this course. This is a great way for you to stay on tune, stick to the direction. Uh, so, and then uh, we have a couple more announcement. Uh, Sunday luncheon, we have uh, Asian food uh, next month, Fe uh, February 12th. So Koreans, Japanese, and Chinese food we will have on that day. Uh, yeah, we have Two more announcements. One thing, we have uh, lots of clothes and items over there. We'll, we'll receive these uh, donations from our own church family members here to support the uh, missions, uh, First Nation ministry, other ministries. So if you will, please go and buy something by donation. Maybe a dollar, a few coins will be, will be great. Uh, and... Uh, we have like three different uh, groups for uh, young adults. And one of them, uh, we just started uh, uh, with uh, Owen and Lucine. Uh, they are having a special gathering today, right? And bowling right after service. And lunch also will be provided. Wow. So if you will, if you're a young adult, you're in uh, 18 to 40-ish, so you can come over to... Uh, him. Can you raise your hand, Owen? Yeah. Yeah, Owen over there. So you can meet him in foyer right after church. Yes, Luca. That's a great question. Wow. Wow. That's a great question. Maybe you can ask. Uh, oh, and after that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I hope you can be a part of the group. So, yeah, this is it. This time, we'd like to welcome Joy Manuel here to bring all our petition to the Lord. Yes? All cards. Yeah, we also have lots of cards left over. Like, we have cards for uh, our church members. 
a lot of them are not attending at this moment. Uh, but anyway, so hopefully you can check uh, the cards over there on the table. And this time, I'd like to ask Joy to lead us to prayer. Yes. Hmm? Oh, kids. Oh, kids. Yeah. Kids, you may go now. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. There's many things happening. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Can you also pray for the kids as well? Good morning once again. As we sang in worship, thank you worship team, it's all about him. So as we go into prayer time, I'd just like to focus <clears throat> some, uh, the first psalm. How happy is the one who doesn't walk in the advice of the wicked. Instead, his delight is in God's instructions. And he meditates on it day and night. So let's pray, focusing on God's word. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for so many things. We would be here for days and hours if we started thanking you for everything you've given us. Thank you for the freedom we have in this country at this moment to be able to come into your house of worship. Don't know how long it'll last. We thank you for your living word that many of us can read in our own language. Lord, there is power in your word. You spoke and creation came into being. You spoke and the birds and the creatures of the sea filled them up. David remarks in Psalm 119, your word is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. So we praise you and thank you, Lord, for your word. Your son, Jesus Christ, as he came into this world, being the son of God and son of man, and as he was being tempted, used your word. It is written. It is written. He said that three times, and Satan left him. So once again, Lord, we praise you. Your word is full of examples. Lives being changed. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And as you ministered, Lord, you showed the strength and the power of your words for the paralytic who had been sitting for the water to be shaken for 38 years. And as he encountered you as the word, get up. And those words, he leapt to his feet. Being there for 38 years were washed away, were gone in a second. Lazarus that was in the tomb for three days. And the sisters had no hope. Yes, they had hope. You, in the day of resurrection, we will see him. But you spoke to Lazarus. Come out, Lazarus. And he left his death clothes and walked out. And countless others, Lord, as we look through your word, the woman at the well, had to come at an unusual hour because of what her life was. But when you spoke to her, when you gave her the word, springs of living water came. She went back to her town and that one woman was able to bring the whole town 
to meet the Messiah. And so, Lord, we are a privileged people. We are privileged at Faith Baptist Church to be able to ponder, to be able to read your word, to delve into it. And I thank you for Pastor Jeremy and Hiju that have started the series on strong bones. If we need to survive in this declining culture, we need to be able to build strong bones, strength so that as the foundation becomes strong, no matter what the storms of life will deal, we can withstand that storm. And as the other groups, Lord, Owen and his wife, the young couples that Jeremy and Hiju are leading, the Bible study groups and others, as we learn more and more about your word, may it become a second nature to us. And for all that we strive for, Lord, unless you change lives, our toil is worthless. So we thank you for our church. We thank you for all the groups that are working together to bring your word to life in our lives. Thank you for the children, Lord. They've always had a very special place in my heart. And as they've gone to Sunday school, Lord, pray for the teachers that each one would be anointed by your spirit. Solomon says in Proverbs, train a child in the way and he will not walk away from it. These children need your word. They need the right instruction, Lord. In the schools, they're facing such conflicting ideas. Everything taking them away from creation. So be with that precious group, Lord, that as they grow up, your instructions, your light would always be in their path. And finally, Lord, as <clears throat> Pastor Jeremy brings your word to us, may each one of us be receptive to your word. Anoint him that it's not his words, but your words that we hear because those words are going to be life-changing. And as we witness the two funerals this week, Lord, those are the words we want to hear from you when it is our time. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And all God's people say, Amen. Joy. I wonder if you've ever experienced culture shock before, whether it has been in another country that you visited or maybe when you came to Canada, you experienced culture shock. I remember the first few weeks where I was living in Taiwan as a missionary, and as I was walking through the marketplace, I would be getting bumped by people as I walked. And it would start to irritate me that People were walking into me and bumping into my shoulder, and even sometimes there would be scooters navigating through the market, and the side view mirror would hit you on the arm. And I started to get really frustrated and wondered, am I the only one being bothered by this right now? And I discovered that I likely was the only one being bothered by that because that was the way things are in a large city like Taipei. But one thing that I learned as a missionary over time is that when you go into another country, you have to suspend your judgment and you have to realize that you come with your own bias, that you have a particular worldview that you are operating from and that that is not necessarily the way things should be in another culture. And so it's very similar to us when we come to know Jesus Christ in our Christian journey. We come with a worldview already. We come with a background and a story. 
when we become a disciple of Christ. And what Jesus tells us to do is to repent, which is not just to turn away from sin, but to repent means to adopt a totally new way of thinking. It is to turn from your own personal worldview and adopt a new worldview that is other than your own. See, Jesus invites us to be a disciple. A disciple means a disciplined learner. And what Jesus talked about, probably the most out of any other subject, he talked about the kingdom of God. That when you become a believer, you enter this new reality. And that each of us now is on this journey of discipleship to learn what does it mean to walk in the ways of Jesus and to turn from the ways of the world. See, we have to unlearn many things before we can learn the right way of behaving in the world. See, we're in a series called Good Bones, in examining the letter of 1 Timothy, what it means to be part of this new reality, this new community called the church. See, the church, the word for church is ecclesia, which means called out ones. See, God has taken each and every one of us out of the world and he has placed us into this new community, this new culture. And now it is this journey of learning how do we operate now as a called out people. See, each of us bring our own background, our own stories, and our own biases. But we have to learn now, what does the scripture say? And how do we live in light of the scriptures? So the passage we're going to look at today is one of the most controversial sections of Scripture in the New Testament. It has divided churches, denominations, has caused disunity. And many pastors actually avoid preaching on this subject because of its controversy. But one thing that I've learned over the years as a preacher is that I don't get the privilege of editing the scripture. But my job is to, to project and to proclaim what this word says. We believe here today the word of God is alive and active. And every single word, every single verse is able to inform our situation here now in 2023. So I'm going to invite you as we open the word of God to come as a disciplined learner, to come with the heart of a disciple, and we are likely going to read some passages that will, you might have a knee-jerk reaction against. You might already have a particular view on this passage. But can we come together in a fresh way and ask the Lord, the Holy Spirit, what do you want to teach me through your word in the day that we are living in? So let's come to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 to 15. Paul says to Timothy, I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with that of a proper, what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works." Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness and self-control. What we see right away is Paul is addressing two types of people in the church, male and female. He is addressing both men and women here. And what we understand as we will look into the context together is that there are men and women who are coming into the church and behaving in a worldly manner that was not conducive for what it meant to be called out ones, to be the church. And so Paul is seeing that this is necessary to call them out and to teach them in the early inception of the church of how we should operate and how we should avoid behaving. So we're going to look firstly 
about the principle of harmony. I want to set a foundation before we actually go into the verses. The principle of harmony helps us understand that the whole word of God is consistent and does not contradict itself. So if you read this section of scripture by itself alone, then you may come to a conclusion that is other than the whole corpus of scripture. And what we learn when we read the Bible in its entirety is that it clearly identifies men and women as created in the image of God with equal worth, dignity, and potential. So we need to, right from the outset, rule out any kind of gender superiority in this passage. The second thing we can look at is the principle of history. See, God spoke his word to a particular historical and cultural setting in the region of Palestine in the Greco-Roman world. So we have to understand that the Bible was written a long time ago, addressed to a certain group of people, while still understanding that its principles and truths are able to inform us in the day that we are living in. And I want to give you an example of this. So we all remember Jesus asking his disciples to wash each other's feet. We know that in the, the context of that, that Jesus' followers, people at that time wore sandals, and by the end of the day, their feet were very dirty and smelly, and so it was this debased form of servitude. But we know as Christians in 2023, we don't go around offering to wash each other's feet. But we understand that this verse is telling us that there should be no level that we would be unwilling to go to, to serve and love each other. Another example, if you think about Peter addressing the Christians, asking them to greet one another with a holy kiss. Right? Some of us in our cultures do that. When you see them, they greet you with a holy kiss, and that's wonderful. Some of you may not like that. But we understand that this was a cultural practice at that time. That this was not meant to be a universal commandment for believers throughout all of the ages. So there is two ends of the spectrum that we need to consider as we go into difficult passages like this. And one of the areas we need to think about is the rigid literalism. See, some people, when you come to the Bible, there is a rigid literalism, which means that you take every single word literal. You obey everything that it says, regardless of the context that it's written in. But the other end of the spectrum that you have to be aware of is soft liberalism. See, you can have rigid li literalism, and you can have soft liberalism. What is liberalism? Well, it sees the Bible as symbolic. See, a liberal view of the scriptures is someone who reads it and says, well, that was for that time and that place and really has nothing to inform me now. So all it really is is an interesting fact and information. And we need to, as God's people, be careful that we do not slide into one of these ends of the spectrum. We understand, yes, that it, there is a cultural Thing happening at play, but we also know that this is the word of God and meant to inform us today. So with that, let's enter into the first verse. And I want to pay attention to four different things that we're going to see through this verse, these verses. And firstly, it's going to be the men. So Paul is suggesting that in the church, men should be marked by prayer. He says, I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger and quarreling. See, in every society, there is a stereotype that men have of being strong and independent and self-sufficient. Men tend to compare each other by their, their job, their title, their income, their physical stature, and their intelligence. I read a study that said that the, the taller a man is, the more he gets paid. Wouldn't that be great for some of you tall people here? The taller a man is, the more he gets paid. And this is how our world dictates value. Very much by external things. 
by education, by stature, by income. But Paul says this is not meant to be how we operate in the church. Paul's saying the way to stand out and define yourself in the church is by your character, reflected in your prayer life. Paul is saying, if you want to be a man of God, you need to be a man of prayer. And what is prayer? Prayer is an expression of our dependence on God. It is totally counter-cultural to what a male should be. A male should be independent and strong, always have the right answers. Paul is saying, man should be a man of prayer. Prayer teaches us to depend on God. Prayer insinuates that we don't have all the answers. Prayer has the idea of surrender. And that's why Paul is saying, I want them to lift holy hands. Was Paul a a Pentecostal? See, Paul was speaking to a Jewish cultural practice of, of raising hands. And I read that Raising hands at that time for the early Jews was a symbolic for an openness to God's desires. But it also represented a solidarity with other members in the community. I want you to think about Joshua and her holding up Moses' arms in the battle. When Moses' arms got tired, these men lifted his arms and the armies of Israel were able to be succeeding. See, the raised arms and hands to heaven is a symbol of our dependence on the Lord. You can think about a modern-day expression. If a police officer is coming to someone breaking the law, what will they say? Put your hands in the air. What does that communicate? I take the control off my life. I'm taking control off of my situation. Paul is saying, this is how men should be characterized, by dependence on God. Lord, I don't know, but I'm going to trust you. But we know that this wasn't happening in this church. There was men who were angry and quarreling, the word says. The word quarreling literally means to fight. They're looking for ways to divide and to conquer. And and Paul is saying, this is not how the church operates. James 4, 1 to 3, informs us of this quarreling. He says in chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. See, God has given every single man a great passion. But the question is, how will we channel that passion? Will we channel that passion to be strong and independent and to fight? Or will we channel that passion to the priorities of God? See, you may view prayer as something that is soft and something that is humble. But prayer is a great and powerful weapon, James says. It is powerful and effective. And the greatest way, men, to fight is through prayer. The best way to be led The best way to lead is to be led by God. So that is Paul's word to men. He then goes into the conduct of women. And I want to look at this next part, that women should be marked by modesty. Verse 9, Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. See, this is where we need to understand the context of what Paul is speaking to to Timothy. The context of this letter is in the city of Ephesus. 
And in Ephesus, there was this great temple of Artemis where the goddess Diana was worshipped. And in this temple were women priests. This religious system was dominated by women who would dictate everything that would happen in that temple. And men, as a result, were to shrink down and to obey and to withdraw from, from having authority. And so Paul, scholars point out that Paul is likely addressing this influence that has pervaded the culture. And he's saying, that is not the way to, to come into the house of God. These women who are dressed in scantily clothed clothes and jewelry with their Gucci and Dolce Gabbana. This is not the way to come into the house of God. Because when we come to God's house, who are we here for? We're here for God. And anything that takes the attention off of God is not right. And these women, see, they were interested in taking the attention off of God and wanted it on themselves. When they dressed up and came into the house of the Lord, they were thinking, how can I steal the attention so that people notice me? Paul's saying, this should not be the case. We all know the Golden Globe Award ceremony, if you watch those ever. The intention of these actors is to pay thousands of dollars for this dress or this, these clothes that they will wear once in their life. They will walk down this red carpet, and their intention is to steal everyone's affection. All of the cameras, all the lights, they want it on them. And this is the attitude of these women in the church. They wanted everyone to turn their heads and see them. But as we come into the house of God, we have what Paul uses the word modesty, which means that we, in the way that we dress and conduct ourselves, we're not looking to get attention. We're looking to give God the attention. See, whenever someone is on a stage here, our role, whether we're leading worship or Preaching the word of God is to function as a mirror, directing your attention up. So Paul is saying, a woman should look at their inner life of great value. See, the culture will tell you that your value is on your beauty, on how you look. But the Lord looks at your character. He looks at the sincerity of the heart. I want you to think about Samuel who who was searching for a new king. They had determined that Saul was not going to be the right king. He was tall, he was handsome, but he did not have the character that God was looking for. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, this is what the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So as we come to the house of the Lord, it is a prayer of saying, Lord, would you look inside of me? Would you test me and know me? Would you do a spring cleaning in my soul? Not to allow myself to take any attention off the purpose here, and that is to give God praise and glory. The next section from verse 11 to 14. It says, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So yesterday at uh, Pastor Jack Purdy's funeral, I heard a great prank that he pulled on his family. And I had to share it today because it was right in line with this message. So 
his family came down for church one Sunday morning and they found this note on the table and it said, I believe in women's rights. And so they didn't see anything else. They kind of wondered what, what was going on there. And then finally, when they were re getting ready to go to church, they went to put their shoes on and all of their left shoes were missing. Jack had hidden all the shoes, so there were only women's rights. It took me a minute to catch that. But he believed in women's rights. As we talk about this, it's important that we recognize that women have been oppressed for a long time throughout history. And in the Middle East, even right now, in many other places, that women are forced into hiding, unable to roam the streets, to work or to drive or teach due to an extreme fundamentalism view of women. I learned this week that right now there are 17,000 sex slave workers in Canada and that 96% are female. Many of them were born and raised in Canada. So there are real victims in this world who suffer under the impression, oppression of men. But again, we come back to the context of Paul's writing to Timothy in Ephesus. There are these women who deliberately were trying to overpower and take control of the room when they entered the room. They were beginning to dominate, and as a result, men were being silenced. Men were shrinking from their responsibility as spiritual head and being suppressed by these women. Paul is addressing this issue in the church. Eugene Peterson, who writes a commentary on the message translation or commentary, he says it this way. I think this can really help us. I don't let women take over and let, tell men what to do. They should study to be quiet and obedient along with everyone else. Adam was made first, then Eve. Women was deceived first, our pioneer of sin, with Adam at her heels. See, Paul uses the Genesis account to help teach this concept. And so I want to go back to Genesis just for a moment. We all know that God was creating the world. He was declaring over and over, it is good, it is good, until he created man. After man was created, the Lord said it wasn't good that man be alone. And so Eve was created. And God said, let us make him a helper. See, many people get caught up in these words like helper and submission. But, you know, the deeper I studied the word helper, you'll find in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that the word for helper is used 17 times in reference to God's care for his people. And so when it says that I'm going to make him a helper, it is expressing something of God's character. Something that God does for us. That we become co-laborers together. We become helpers to one another in this work of tending the garden. So it is not meant to be a chauvinistic term or to imply dominance, but a complementary role to, to, to Adam and to man. What you'll find in, in the Word of God as we talk about harmony in the scriptures, you'll know throughout the scriptures that there are many moments where Jesus is intentionally championing women. And this would have been scandalous to the original culture. It was just not done. Women were, were suppressed. They did not have rights. But think about Mary, who was at the feet of Jesus, listening to his teaching. And if you remember the scenario, Jesus goes to Martha, who's busy with her hospitality and her cooking and housekeeping, and he says, why are you so busy? The best place to be is at my feet. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that you should be here learning among other disciples as well. 
Paul mentions many women in his letters, thanking them for their work in the gospel. There is Dorcas and Phoebe and Lydia and Priscilla and Junia. These were business women known for their charity and their good works as women who were contributing to the work of the gospel in the early church. If you read the genealogy as we did a few weeks ago, you will see that there were women listed in that genealogy. That was scandalous to include women's names. A genealogy always listed only the men and their sons. But Jesus deliberately championed women. Finally, I want to read the final verse in verse 15. And we're going to read it again in the message paraphrase. I think it helps us really understand the heart of the translation. And it says, On the other hand, her childbearing through brought about salvation, reversing Eve. But this salvation only comes to those who continue in faith, love, holiness, gathering it all into maturity. You can depend on this. So is Paul saying here that a woman is saved by childbearing? That the means to salvation is having a child? Well, we would know, knowing the scriptures, that salvation is through faith in Jesus alone. But the paraphrase helps us understand that through the lineage of Abraham's descendants, through the childbearing that happened thousands of years ago, the Savior of the world came into this world through the Virgin Mary. And through that birth, we can all be reborn in Christ. In our society, it's becoming more and more apparent that that children are not a blessing anymore. They, society makes it so difficult to have children. They're seen as a burden, as a financial stress. This is really not God's heart. The God told us that it is a blessing to have children. He told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and to multiply. Yes, it will be costly. It will be difficult. There will be seasons where it just seems overwhelming. But this is the means by which we make disciples. And I want to just champion the stay-at-home moms this morning who are giving your time and your energy, who are up late at night caring for your children. You are doing a godly thing. You are raising your children in the Lord. And God sees that. You are raising disciple-makers. When I come home from the office, I have to remember that my wife is working an equivalent of three jobs at home. And so we need to give that respect that is due to the women in our church. So what what was Paul trying to do here? He was trying to reprogram the church, helping them understand the role of men and women in the body of Christ. He's redeeming the, the stereotypes of roles that were in the culture. See, men, he's saying, don't measure yourself by worldly standards, by your strength and acumen and education. Let your character be marked by a dependence on the Lord. He's saying to women, don't be measured by the world's standard of beauty and value. Let your life be marked by a modest humility. Let God see the character being formed in you as a co-disciple in the church of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that it is alive and active and that it can teach and reproof and correct and train us in godliness. Thank you, Lord, for calling us out of darkness into your glorious light. Thank you for giving us the community of God's people. Lord, each and every one of us come with a different story. We come with a worldview and we come with our own flesh. But Lord, you are reprogramming us by your Holy Spirit to walk in your spirit and not to gratify the desires of the flesh. Help us to be a people, Lord, who put you and you alone on display. God, where there is anything in us that would want to take the attention off of you, may you correct that in us, Lord, so that we would be a church that exalts the name of Jesus, that people would see our love for one another 
that our church would be a place that champions women, that encourages them and inspires them and supports them. And Lord, may we be a church where men lift up hands in dependence and prayer to you. Lord, so that we may see more and more people come into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeremy, for <clears throat> the message this morning. And um, as we sing this next song, we're going to exalt Jesus' name. And we're going to, to celebrate the life, um, a renewed life um, in this song. And so hope that encourages you and with the baptism as well. I hope that this song um, shows that. So I invite you all to stand and. And that's saying mighty to say.
1 Peter 5, verse 6. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at a proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by our brothers around the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We have a prayer team meeting on the side. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you, church.